This is Matt Hill, and you're listening to Monday Morning Critic. Perfect. And this is Landon Johnson. You're listening to Monday Morning Critic. Excellent. So you guys are childhood friends. Do I have that part right? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> we so, go way so, back. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about those like early days. Uh, were you like... So uh, this is my second interview. I'm bringing up the Fablemans um, because it's just about <laughs> it's just about love of movies, like and movie making. And the guest I had before, I thought of him. And then I thought of you guys because you're friends when you're younger. Mm-hmm. Talk about the early days. Your the interest that you shared, like anything you wanted to share uh, on that topic. Oh my God, Landon, you're going to be super embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be super embarrassed too, but we met in junior high school and we immediately bonded because we were both big nerds and we played, I think we were doing track and field, but we were also playing Magic the Gathering at lunch and then Dungeons (laughs) and Dragons. And we like, we found, we immediately, we were immediate friends. We had a love of Tolkien. We were reading the same sci-fi and fantasy novels. We just, all the overlapping interest early on. Mm -hmm. Um, but I distinctly remember Magic the Gathering at lunch <laughs> our oh, yes. junior oh, yes. high school. Um, and then, like, very, very quickly, I um, I have been drawing since I was a little kid. I worked in comic books for a little stint as an artist. Um, so when we were in high school and junior high and stuff, we had this dream of making comic books together. Like, that was the initial form of our collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a lot of that early on. Landon um, and another friend of ours writing short stories in this science fiction fantasy world and, you know, drawing it. Landon would come over on the weekends and spend the night at my house and I, we'd draw comics all night. Simpler times. Simpler yeah, exactly. Times. <laughs> that hasn't happened in like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys don't get together for like any magic to gathering you guys don't do that anymore like oh, you can't well, oh no we still nerd out for sure yeah, yeah. for sure <laughs> just invited me to go play warhammer with him so yeah, yeah. The, yeah the nerd is still very present yeah our nerd <laughs> cards are legit <laughs> so, so i'm older than you guys i'm 49 so i'm probably significantly older than you but i will tell you that when i was younger the term nerd was offensive now it's like a blessing like it's a it's a, it's like if you're called a nerd it's like thank you like i appreciate that like you yeah. know, keep Our it coming memory i'll take of it. like junior high and being nerds is very different than like the way it exists now yeah <laughs> yeah 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 uh, so what movies or actors uh landon if you wanted to start this what what did you, what movies or actors or directors i mean I, I get the gist of like what the core of your relationship and rapport is what about, you know, any type of shows or movies or uh, a genre, anything like that? I mean, we've always been drawn to like heavy, heavy, heavy genre stuff as far as like things that are uh, allow your imagination to really run wild, like fantasy, sci-fi, you know, far ends of the spectrum. Uh, I remember uh, we very much enjoyed uh, sneaking out of school to go hit the Lord of the Rings movies when those were coming uh, out in the theaters, nice. right? Like nice. that, that kind of like epic fantasy at that scale that was still grounded in reality where, you know, lots of the stuff you were seeing on the screen was real and all that, like that had such a hold on our imagination as kids. And we went to, you know, terrible lengths and did some things we probably shouldn't have done in order to like, we had to go see him in the theater and we had to see him on that first day. So, you know, we'd like forge parent signatures and all the rest of that stuff to get out. Things you do when you're in school. Uh, Can I just say something, how awesome uh, our diverse backgrounds are? Uh, Landon, you look like you're ready for war. Matt's yeah, ready. To, yeah. Matt's ready for design. Matt's got beautiful pictures for it, it is nursery. Like I just think it's awesome. Like how great is this? Yeah, yeah. I, I love your your arrangement of your uh, various place sets in the back there. Like yes, yeah, so, like we could not have three different more three different backgrounds. That's yeah, that's fantastic. great. Uh, so so movie making, I feel like from your end, not I would I wouldn't know, but I feel like it's a laborious process. It's very difficult. Mm-hmm. So you have to have somebody that you've. Um, I don't, is there like a director that you you I don't want to say pattern yourself after, but is there somebody growing up that you're like, boy, I love the way he or she does things. I really like it because for you guys to stick in movie making and doing what you're doing, we'll get to exactly that. That is, you have to be in love with what you do, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I can speak for myself in that, like my background is multidisciplinary. I've uh, had the opportunity to tell stories in a multitude of spaces and I hope I get to continue to do it. So my inspirations aren't isolated to film and gosh, the inspirations have changed so much. Like I think what, you know, Jordan Peele and Robert Edgars are doing right now is incredible. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I went through like a real Hitchcock noir phase when I was in college and was really digging on that stuff. 
Um, I've done a lot of theater work too. So, you know, there's a couple of um, European directors, Georgie Paro, that I just really, really idolize um, the way they approach staging, the way they approach their work with actors and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, early on, Landon, I don't, I mean, obviously Landon brought up Lord of the Rings. So, yeah, you know, great. Jackson and Spielberg yeah. and, you know, some of that, <laughs> Coppola. Yeah. Um, and then I don't, yeah. So my journey has been interesting and I find myself pulling from all of these weird spaces, right. the, you know, theater of the absurd movement and, uh, uh, you know, opera and all of these other weird disparate places. Landon actually went to film school though. So his journey might be more direct. Uh, thinking about the stuff that really inspired <laughs> us. I remember, uh, oddly enough, maybe not oddly enough, but I remember, uh, the first Batman, uh, with, uh, Christopher Nolan being a really, compelling thing not just because uh i think in large part because we had just seen um memento so you had this kind of just incredibly complex and fragmented narrative that somehow he managed to like piece it all together and make you really think but then he kind of reinvented the superhero genre in a way by like telling that uh origin story and the way that the film is crafted is just it's one of those movies where you don't look at it and you don't go like, you know, this is like high art or something like that, but it's just so perfectly and meticulously pieced together. And then all the stories started coming out about how like they only had one cut, which who knows if that's true or not. But like, it was very clear from the get go that like his natural skill was just incredible. Yeah. And so you watch something like that and you go, you know, I think I can get there. It's going to take me more time, but I'm, I want to get there. Right. So then you've got a thing to aim for. Uh, and then, you know, Matt and I cut our teeth doing all sorts of random stuff. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in being able to start on projects that are achievable for you where you're at and making sure you can hit those goals and actually deliver something and then exp stretch yourself a little bit and do the next thing and then stretch yourself a little bit and do the next thing. So I, right. uh, early on in our career, uh, Matt mentioned I went to uh, uh, college for film. I mean, Matt says that, but then he went to college to tell like stories in all sorts of different formats. So he's got all that stuff under his belt too. But we did a micro budget feature. Landon, Landon where did you go to school? If you don't mind me asking, where did you go to uh, school? USC. Oh wow, wow, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, Matt and I wanted to do a feature film before we got out of college, which was probably not the wisest idea in the world. But <laughs> it ended up working out okay. In yeah. that uh, we did this micro budget feature called "Hello, My Name Is Charlie," where we had thirty thousand dollars, like end to end, to finish, start and finish the whole thing. Wow. We crewed it with kids that were from the high school we graduated from, and cast it mostly with them because we wanted to give them an opportunity to learn what it was like to act in front of the camera. Um, we gathered all of our college friends who are also all you know learning the trade of cinema, used them to like be the DPs and the camera ops, and you know lighting crew and all the rest of that stuff. And we all just had a summer of kind of crazy fun getting together. Like we all crashed at Matt's house in, you know, on the days that we weren't shooting, um, crammed this thing out in like three weeks, cut it together. It ended up being like a super awesome fun thing, but that was kind of a, I think that was our moment of realizing that this is a, uh, it's not a sprint, uh, sport it's a marathon sport yeah and we had the fortitude as friends and as artists to make that marathon get over the line and then you know keep moving forward so matt where did you well said landon matt where did you go to school i went to a tiny school called the university of laverne where nice. i am the only person to my knowledge that has graduated with a degree in narrative technology Wow. But you know what, like you said, though, your background of this eclectic background you have, I think you guys are like well suited for each other because of your backgrounds. Right. Mm -hmm. If you both had same the same backgrounds, I don't think it works. Right. No, we both bring something so unique. Yeah. And that's what's really fun about our collaboration yeah. is, you know, leaning into that expertise. We know what each other are good at. And, you know, mm. we have a lot of trust, which is also super critical when you're trying to uh, when you both got hands on the steering wheel. Right. Um, and knowing that like, oh, if that's something that's in Matt's expertise, then we go with mine. But if it's with something that I know that Landon is really good at and he's feeling strongly, then like it should totally go his way. Right. And when you're on set, you've got to make decisions so quickly most of the time that there's not time to step back and have a 10 minute conversation um, and shut down the set. You've just got to have the trust and you've just got to go. Um, right. 
so, so making it like this this wonderful movie we're going to get to it in a moment w- when you're making it is it your call like as i've had other guests on where they get frustrated with the film process right whether it's you know adding something somebody up or somebody getting going in last minute adding something to the script or editing something they probably weren't supposed to or a producer probably dipping his or her nose where they shouldn't have is that like common is it is it so just like what's the process i mean i guess if you if you tell me the right answer and you're crapping on somebody i've kind of ruined like i don't want to ruin anything but well, let, let me let me phrase it. Is it is it frustrating sometimes? I guess is that a better way of we'll, saying it? We'll we'll keep it delightfully general. In that okay. Matt and I have had this running joke now that we uh, we tried to cram every possible horror story that you hear about independent filmmaking into this first one, so that we could just get them all out of the way. So the next one should be <laughs> these. Um, but like everything you listed and more, you know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, all, all of it happened for sure. I will say though that like by nature, like the, we alone couldn't go and make the next great American film. We might be able to go paint the next great American, you know, uh, portrait, but we can't make a film alone. Um, so it's, you know, it's a collaborative process by nature. And so you are inviting those things in. And I think it's right. really important to know from the get go kind of what you're getting into. And like, we really like the collaborative process. So like as, frustrating as that can be at moments there's also moments where someone brings something to the table that you didn't know you wanted or didn't know you needed um and so like it's a balancing act we always talk about for us in our collaboration like finding the things that are absolutely unchangeable that are so core to our vision that they can't be messed with and then the rest of it is up for debate you know the rest of it is is malleable based on the resources the day the time who yes. else is at the table with us all of those other factors so uh as frustrating as it can be it's also a feature <laughs> and not a bug of the process of you know collaborating on something that takes literally hundreds of people to make yeah, yeah. and and and, and I wish so and so would mind his damn or her damn business. <laughs> oh, so yeah, you know, <laughs> that too? That too? a producer showing up and handing you pages and being yeah, like, "This yeah. is what the scene, yeah. the scene should yeah. be like," and you're like, "Yeah, that's not the scene." Yeah, yeah, Thank you, like, yeah, but yeah. that's yeah, we're just gonna put that over here. He's like pulling on your shirt, going like, "Okay, it's time to you know call action." Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> handing you pages. Yeah. So, so I I just love war movies. I mean, my dad and I bonded to them. Like, we I I love them. I love this. Um, let me ask you, are there war movies coming into this that, not that you had in mind because this is clearly it's original in its own way, but are there movies like that you had in mind uh, uh, that you just liked going into it, that you admired going into it? Well, yes. <laughs> there's I'm a, sure there's, there's many. Some, like, but... weird, like we talked about The Conformist a lot um, mm. when we talked about how we wanted to approach this film and really how we thought it would look. Um, we really love that. There's also a film called The Miracle of Bern, which is a German film, um, uh, actually post World War II, that we also really, really loved and informed a lot of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember talking about uh, Path to Glory, though I don't actually know how that film informed <laughs> this one now. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. it's a little bit um, of a funny thing. Like we we love all the ones you think about, like you know, uh, Saving Private Ryan and th- things like that. But I think it's because we appreciated. Uh, and enjoyed these kind of bombastic, really big stories that uh, we were led to tell a story that was more intimate or like, you know, what what does it look like to see the story of the person who's behind enemy lines, who doesn't want to fight, but wants to resist? Like how not many people are telling that story. What does that story look like? And so then working on something like that, I think to some extent is motivated by the fact that other people have done the big battle scenes and done an incredible job of it. Right. But that's not what this is. And I love the way it, it, it unravels. Um, let me ask you. So I was trying to, I was dying to ask you this all day. Why, why the name change? Cause it was res, uh, resistance 1942 <laughs> and then burning up both ends. Is that back to our earlier discussion of people thinking they will know better? Like, how does that, how does that work out? Cause I mean, it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, there's iconic movies that have gone undergone many name changes. I mean, I, that, that happens a lot, but in your case, if, if, if it's okay, why why did that why did that happen i'll jump in <laughs> oh did we lose landon i landed you were so still i thought we lost you um it, it purely practical we you know burning it both ends was the the first title of this film and it's still our favorite title but due to the process of filmmaking we yeah. released foreign first um we didn't have control over name changes in some of those territories 
it got changed over there. And then when it came time to do our domestic, they wanted it to match the title in other English speaking territories. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And so it was a really practical decision. Um, and, you know, we felt like we needed to support the process at that moment. And yeah. uh, um, so it is Resistance 1942, which isn't a, a bad title. We just favor and we like the poetic title. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know, I, this is a, this is I think the second or third time I've had co-directors on. I had Tyler Nielsen and Michael Schwartz from Peanut Butter Falcon. Oh, cool. Um, and, and I know your background and, and I get that. But but how does it work? How does the process work? Matt, is there something particularly that you do really well? Landon, is there something that you do really well? We talked about each of you bringing your own thing to the project. Um, is there, like, in this case, what do you think, the, the, I'm sure there are many things, but, like, what do you bring to each other to come? Because co-directing is not, it's not uncommon, but it's not super common. Like, it's not, like, you don't see it all the time. You see it. Um, it's more impressive when it's done well, like it is here. But just talk about what that's like. And, and I, I understand the background, but just the project itself. Yeah, I mean, Matt touched on with regards to, you know, each of us having our expertises. So, yep. like, I do photography and I'm very into music, um, things like that. So, if it tends toward that side of things, sound design, stuff like that, um, in general, we'll kind of default toward what my instincts are. Matt has done incredible work with, like, set design. He's mentioned he's an illustrator. So, if it's something having to do with the visual language and things like that, we tend to re rest on his expertise. Uh, but... I mean, if you ever get a chance to like sit in a writing room with us or be present when we've got a you know crave disagreement or something, we're pretty brutal with each other, uh, but in like a really good way. Like that's that trust that we've built up over the years where one of us can be like, well, what about this? The other can go, that's a really dumb idea. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't do that because of this. And then the, the nice thing is we both have an instinct of at all times we are not aiming for what I want, but rather for what is best. So when the best idea surfaces in the process of that percolation of ideas, we're, we tend to have the same taste for it. So then the, that, that idea rises to the surface and we both go, aha, that's the thing. Yeah. And then we can latch onto that and move forward. Yeah. 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 Matt, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like yeah, we're yeah. both, it's interesting because we have these like separate skill sets, but we're also both very much writers. We're both very much, you know, filmic storytellers. So, you know, it, when we have the time, particularly in early on in the process where there is more time um, uh -huh. and we can really have those conversations and that's where we're laying the foundation for the rest of it. Like that's when we're right. making those critical decisions. We can really hash it out. And we think that's a very valuable part of our process. And we think we really value the brutal honesty in each other. We talk a lot about the, uh, you know, the idea that our, for us, art is forged on an anvil. And that means someone is resisting change and someone is forcing what has to change right. into the process. Right. So one yeah. of us is usually holding on to like, but no, we have to have this <laughs> thing. And then the one's going, but the rest of it's got to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's like, that's the, that's like the benefit of co-direct. Like you have, you have somebody mm. keeping you in check. Whereas a director, sometimes you can lose yourself. Right. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. That's well said. Uh, how about this great cast? My God. Like, I mean, mm. Like, I mean, that. I gotta tell you, I don't, I don't think Jason Patrick's ever done anything like this. Like, and he, no. like, it took me a while. Like, I knew he was in the movie, and I'm like, I can't wait for Jason Patrick to show up. Like, and I'm watching him the whole time. Like, yeah. like how funny is he? I'm like, yeah. where the hell yeah. is Jason Patrick gonna come in this movie? And yeah. I'm like, holy shit, he's really good. Like, they're all really good, but like, I feel like they, I don't, I'm not gonna say stepped out of their comfort zone, but I feel like they're, they're all really unique in their own way in their performances. Yeah. Mm. I mean, like, as, as first time directors operating at this level, like we somehow lucked out, like we, and you know, films live and die by their cast. So like yeah. we truly lucked out. And, you know, when we first met Jason, uh, we were just talking about this the other day, like he already knew who Andre was and he knew how to make him complicated and to bring that gray area to the film. The film desperately wanted for, right? Because uh, some of the other characters operate on these more, you know, uh, not just diametrically opposed poles, but the this kind of more easily understood good and evil. Right. And Jason operates somewhere much closer to the middle, yeah. um, and at moments is moving, you know, uh, to side to side on the spectrum. And he just knew how to bring that, and he knew how to push for it in a in a way that you know is obviously apparent on screen and. Um, it's really, it's incredible. And we're so grateful that he 
did that for us, <laughs> that he just instantly knew. Um, and he knew things that we didn't about the character, too, which was really, I mean, that's what you want in a collaboration, right? You want them to right. bring something that you didn't expect. Right. Landon, is there ever a time where, like, so it, it reminds me of the same question I asked. There was I had a director on who, who did a, a, a war movie, a, a much different war movie, and, and Michael Caine was in it. I said, well, what on earth can you tell Michael Caine that he has? Like, you guys are in the same spot with like Judd and and and, and um and, and Car like like what do you say to Carrie always that he hasn't heard before like yeah. I mean I'm not saying you guys aren't capable I'm saying these guys are at the top of their class like sure. how do you how do you handle that part of it you know it's like an all star cast yeah I mean the it's one of those funny things that they don't really teach you well uh, in things like film school is you you learn a lot in film school about how to like direct someone to get a performance out of them. But when you hit a certain level of cast, like they're going to yeah. deliver a performance that is of a sufficient quality to get to, to begin with. So usually the conversations end up being very philosophical and very grounded in where the character came from you you're usually not talking about the scene you're talking about what happened before the scene and what happens after the scene right. where did that character come from before they walked in the room where do they go after they leave the room and then they because they are such incredible actors are able to take that info import it into who they are as a character and now enter that space with an emotional state already there that you can read as a human being enjoying the movie and then leave and like you end up you know telling these mini stories that have their own arcs within each scene that then propels, pro propels the kind of larger meta arc of the film overall. Uh, so yeah, like we're working with people at this level is a ton of fun because you end up, uh, you're not worried about the nuances of like very small little nitpicky things. You get to talk about much kind of grander ideas of you know why is your character acting in this particular way in this particular moment with reference to the other person. That's a great answer, Matt. Uh, I mean, I, I can echo Landon yeah. for sure. I'll just, yeah. I'll just add, I guess that like I, I was listening uh, to Judd talk about the film uh, this morning because he did a radio thing, yeah. And you know, he was talking about how he immediately knew that Bertrand was going. He he needed he knew Bertrand needed to be just incredibly frustrated with his situation, yeah. and that that was his touchstone for the character. And for him, that also showed that we understood the character to him when he read the script, which was a great compliment. Right. Um, but like you know, a lot of it is about that stuff too. It's about like what is that touchstone that helps unlock the rest of the character because they're you know they're doing the homework, they're bringing it uh, on the day. So it's, you know, like Landon said, it's all those kind of early conversations about background or who they are, or, you know, what the approach is that just, you know, allows you to move through the day without like fundamentally altering the approach or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I got to say, um, great answers, both of you. Um, uh, uh, Judd looks 20 years younger than he is. I mean, I, he, okay. I, watched the, I, I watched the Fablemans over the weekend. He's on screen for probably 10 minutes. He probably steals every second of that and probably... Probably a chance for an Academy Award nomination. I mean, same thing in this movie, too. He's just so good. He's yeah. so good. Uh, is there a moment with any of the actors, whether I mention them or not, that that I'm sure there's many memories you have, but a particular <laughs> one that sticks out, it could be anything. It could be a small little. Is there anything that sticks out from any of the cast that, whether it was a learning experience or, or something you remember mm. fondly? There was a moment um, with uh, Mira Servino. Um, uh, unfortunately, Mira she passed Furlong. Not oh, sorry. Furlong. You know, different Mira. Mira <laughs> yeah. Furlong, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mira, unfortunately, uh, passed away uh, very recently. But, West Nile uh, virus. That's crazy. That's crazy. That crazy? 65 yeah, years yeah. old. I know. I know. And she was just like, uh, if you ever had a chance to meet her, I mean, like, you yeah. talk about a, a woman that was just an incredible just force of personality. Yeah. As a person, you know, both on screen and off. Uh, and we had a moment when we were shooting the end of the film. And she doesn't have a line in that final moment when they're hearing all the people talking from the radio, but like Matt and I were reading the lines off camera to give some motivation um, while we were filming. And she was standing there with just tears running down her face. Oh. And then we called cut and she came over to Matt and I and said, look, because you know, she has a lot of history coming from uh, Croatia and the um, civil war that they had there and stuff. Yeah. And she just said, thank you so much for writing this. Like, I feel like I'm, able to let the world know what it feels like 
to resist something, to lose much, and yet to rise above and come out on the other side. And like ha having someone who has had personal real world experience with something like that, to then say that they felt like what we had written and what we were capturing on screen was touching them at that level was, that is a memory that will stay with me my entire life. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well said. Uh, Matt? I mean, we're not going to top that, but my favorite... <laughs> I mean, Judd is a force of nature. Like, yeah. I hope they, I mean, I, he needs to live forever, but also I hope they reverse <laughs> engineer him because that man has so much energy. He's just bounding around set all the time. He's a big goofball, always telling stories, doing impressions. And we totally didn't expect it. And there's, uh, you know, a moment late in the film where, you know, he has this turn and he decides he's going to go do this thing <laughs> that's yeah. very dangerous. And um, we were, as we were approaching that scene, I, he comes up to Landon and I, and he's been, you know, he's just so jovial. And this was fairly late in the filming process. And he just looks at us both and he goes, watch it. I'm going to make you cry. And he just like, he's so jovial and he just turned on a dime. And like everyone in the room, when he played that moment when we were filming it, we were all touched. You could just see the glassy eyes of all the crew from him because he can, he's just so good. And he was able to turn it on so fast. He was laughing and telling jokes and just, you know, so present with us. And then he just, you know, total game face on moment and watching him do it that quickly um, and actually get us all and deliver on it was really a fun moment. And there's a guy who loves like there's actors I watch. Uh, I'm not going to mention names, but like you could clearly tell they're doing it for a paycheck and to be done with it. He just loves being an actor. Like he loves being with you guys. Like and he said so many nice things when I interviewed him about the both of you. Uh, he was so kind and he was so genuine. And he wasn't just saying it to like being appeasing or be like he genuinely meant what he was saying. Like he's just such a good dude, such a great actor. We Absolutely. love him and hope we get to work with him many more times. It's just so, so much fun. Yeah, so so uh, when you make a movie like this, and, and I get listen, people should watch it regardless, big screen, small screen. I am so partial to big screen, though. I wish people could see everything on a big screen. So I'm sure as directors, that's the way it was intended, right? I mean, or you just happy? Yeah, I mean, but it was hey, a dream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with the small screen either, right? TVs now are coming in like people are normally are getting like 60 inch TVs now, so it's, yeah. we're getting there. But um, is that like moving forward? Is that kind of the thing with directors? It's like you want it. You want people to experience because it's such a beautiful. Uh, the cinematography, stunning. The music, mm. everything's done really well. That sh that needs to be uh, um, enjoyed on a grander scale, right? Absolutely. Uh, and really quickly, just kind of on the business side, uh, uh, this is an interesting thing for those who are out there who are really interested on how kind of the nuts and bolts of film works. Uh, there's a little bit of a shift, it seems like, in the business going with regards to theatrical releases and the risk those represent for films. You know, if you're not like a giant tentpole like a Marvel or something like that, that's going to have yeah, yeah. really large advertising budgets. There's a real risk associated with releasing in theater. And uh, with the way that streaming and the rest has tended, there has been a bit of a move to do almost this like the, uh, like digital theatrical, if you will. Yeah. So like our, our movie is going to be out for a period of time, but then at some point we'll switch to a streamer. Um, and that kind of window is roughly the same size of window as you would have traditionally had in a theatrical release, maybe in the 80s or 90s. But because of the way that the industry has moved and shifted and the risk that gets represented by putting something into a theater and paying the four wall cost to put something out there, uh, uh, I think distribution companies are having to take a look at everything and go, you know, on a case by case basis. And sometimes this is affected by, you know, did their previous films not do as well or did they do really well? Are they willing right. to stomach the appetite of the risk to put this guy out there? All of that is a really fancy way of saying, I completely agree. Our thing should have been in theaters. It would have been great if it was in theaters, but we still think our uh, distributor uh, is doing the best they possibly can given the road that they see in front of them. And maybe someday we'll still be able to, you know, find some way in this crazy world to do a, you know, re-release in a theater or something. Like and that. I want to add that because what you guys have accomplished is amazing. Like I wasn't saying like this needs to be like it, to get in a theater is obnoxiously hard. I mean, you have to, it's, it's, but what you guys have accomplished with this, what the whole team has accomplished is pretty amazing in itself. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what's the future look like? I mean, it, does, do you, st are you still going to do your own things and, you know, do, together, like how, how does the future work for each of you? Like, what, what's the plan moving forward? Do more. Um, <laughs> together, uh, yeah. Uh, 
we will always continue to collaborate with each other. We've been cooking up a number of things. Um, we're also, you know, we are desperate to create our next film and we're hard at work at that. And then, yeah. you know, we're also playing in some other modalities of storytelling. Um, we're playing in the immersive space as well. Um, yeah, hopefully lots more to come from us. Very nice. Um, nothing I feel like we can talk openly about, but we are, you know, creative storytellers at heart. And uh, um, we're just going to keep, you know, creating and, and finding new stories to tell. Yeah. Uh, Leander, what did you want to say? Is that, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, uh, you know, we've, we've got a, uh, uh, we're jokingly calling it a side quill, uh, to <laughs> since 1942, where we nice. uh, tell the story of Rama Tuel, which, uh, when, uh, folks get a chance to watch, they'll, they'll realize how that figures into the end. And kind of, that's an important story that's happening off the frame, if you will. And so we wanted to tell that story of what happens in that village. Uh, yeah. so yeah, we've, we've got quite a few things coming down the pipe. If you ever need a um overweight aging podcast host, I might know a guy. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I might, you know, very similar to Elway's role in the in the movie. I'm not saying maybe, uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, I want to say that you guys you guys make for a hell of a team. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. You're really nice guys, and I totally enjoyed this interview. Uh, thank you so much. Day. This has been great. Thanks for having us. It's fun to come and chat. Thank you for listening to Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can also connect with Monday Morning Critic on Instagram and Facebook, MDM Critic on Twitter, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found. All episodes available, www.mmcpodcast.com.